will be glad, will rejoice forever. Your kingdom will never fade away. Hallelujah! And this is our Savior, reigning forever. You will return and make all things new. This is our future, with Jesus forever. But death is no more, you'll make all things new. There'll be new joy, new life, the world as it should be. All longing satisfied, and seeing you, our Christ. There'll be no tears, no pain, for we will never die. Before the throne we'll stand, crying worthy is the Lamb. There'll be new joy, new life. The world as it should be, all longing satisfied, and seeing you our Christ. There'll be no tears, no pain, for we will never die. Before the throne we'll stand, crying worthy is the Lamb. Savior, reigning forever, you will return and make all things new. This is our future, with Jesus forever, where death is no more, you'll make all things new. And this is our Savior, reigning forever, you will return and make all things new. Our future with Jesus forever. With death is no more, you'll make all things new.
Good morning, everyone. So great to see you in the main tent here for the Thursday Bible reading of week three of the Keswick Convention 2022. It's lovely to have you here coming flooding in. Welcome to if you're joining us in a relay venue or online. It's really great to have you joining with us this morning. It's lovely to be able to connect up with some of you through social media. There's a tweet here from uh, Tim. Really grateful for Martin Salter's faithful, compassionate, and Christ-exalting exposition of the Jacob narrative. Amen to that. Thank you, Martin. It's done my soul good, not to mention being helpful as I prepare to preach the same section of Genesis this autumn. <laughs> I think others might be doing that series as well. And also, it's wonderful from the Centre Church in Droitwich, enjoyed a church family picnic yesterday. Who's there? How many from Droitwich? Yeah. Church family picnic yesterday on the campsite. And one of the great things about the convention, I know a number of pe people, pastors and others, come as a church group that's here. And it's a great idea, if you, obviously, if you're here, but also if you're joining online, bring a whole group from the church to encourage one another, to meet with one another and share fellowship together and walk with the Lord. So thanks so much for sending them the messages in. Use the hashtag KezConv22 or tag us in photos in at keswickministries.org or send a comment in via the website. That'll be great. Let's just still our hearts away for a moment as we come to the Lord in prayer at the start of our time. Let's pray together. Glorious God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we bless and adore you. We can gather as your people around your throne of grace. Thank you for the fellowship, all one in Christ Jesus. Thank you for the joy of being together. As we sing your praise and hear your word, would we meet with Jesus Christ and be transformed by his spirit we pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Let's rise to our feet. Real blessing to have Phil um, with me, my Keswick friend Phil. I'm um, going to lead a bit of a bit more of a strip back team uh, this morning, and um, we're going to sing um, When I Was Lost. And um, it's one of those songs where if you want to get behind and clap a little bit, that'd be really helpful because we don't have the drums. So um, if you want to get your hands ready, that'd be, uh, that'd be great. Let's, let's praise God together. Son of God has died for 
Thank you so much for your grace for us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you'd like to know a little bit more about what's going on with Keswick Ministries through the year, both prayer requests, other ministries that are going, like teaching and training events, upcoming events and so on, then we'd love to keep in touch with you. The newsletters come out about every six weeks, so it won't be clogging your inbox, but it's full of all those kinds of things. And if you'd like to sign up, we'd love to hit, be in, link up with you through the year, especially for things like kids' registration and news of those kinds of things and, and when volunteer teams are open. So if you'd like to sign up, the way to do that is to go to the Convention 2022 page on the, um, on the website, and then you can see down there, you click down on the right-hand side information point on stay in touch, and you can sign up there for the newsletter there. It'd be great to continue to revalue your prayers through the year for the ministry, and it's lovely to keep in touch with that. 
I'm going to hand over to Steve now. Thank you. Well, good morning. It's a great thrill to see the tent so well filled and also to hear your voices raised in praise. And, and to know that other people are joining from the various relay venues and also engaging with the convention on the live streaming uh, as well. That's a huge thrill. We weren't sure uh, how many people would come to this convention uh, in the year after COVID and with COVID still uh, at fairly high levels. So it's a real encouragement to us uh, that so many people uh, have come. And it's great to be together again physically after two years of being apart and to have a full program of events on during this convention. Again, hugely encouraging. Now, you will know that this convention is fairly unique among similar Christian events in that we don't charge for the event. All are welcome to it to come irrespective of their ability to pay. And that's a very important part of our DNA, which we want to uh, continue. I remember when I was uh, first treasurer, uh, we appointed some management consultants to help us on the Derwent project. And one of them took me to one side and said, Steve, your business model is fundamentally flawed <laughs> in that you make no charge for the event. And I said to him, I said, let me tell you about this business model because God has seen fit uh, to bless this event over at that time 140 years, now 147 years. And every year that I've been treasurer, the income has always covered the cost. God has been so faithful through the generosity of his people. But there is a cost, of course, too, putting on a convention uh, like this. And it's around 800,000 pounds. That's before you add in salary costs. And this, just to give you an idea of some of the main parts of that cost, we spend around 250,000 pounds on technical support. We have a wonderful team of, of technical people supporting not just the main tent, but also the relay venues, the children and youth work, the seminars, and, all, and other events as well. And that costs about 250,000 pounds. We have a wonderful army of volunteers helping at the convention, about 650 across the three weeks of the convention. And they all need to be accommodated and they need to be fed. And that's broadly another 250,000 pounds. And then of course there's the hire of this marquee and the youth at marquee as well, and that's about 100,000 pounds. We reckon that equates to about 120 pounds for every adult attending one week of the convention. And of course, if people gifted on top of that, that is even better. We understand that some can't afford that, and you're still welcome. Others give very generously to enable those who can't afford it uh, to come and to enable the books to balance. And we're very grateful for that as well. Now, because of the pandemic and the rising cost of living, our donations this year have been a little bit down. And so we come into the convention more than 50,000 pounds behind where we hoped we would be in terms of donations. And we're also well down on the Derwent funding as well. And so our ask is that however you're accessing this convention, whether here in the main tent, in some of the relay, relay venues, or on the live stream, that you would give very careful consideration and prayerful consideration as to how you might be able to help us uh, move forward financially and support the work. To ensure that this unique event with its very countercultural business model continues to grow and to flourish. God has blessed this ministry over 147 years through the generosity of his people. And we are confident that God will continue to bless uh, this work. And so we're so thankful to all of you for all your help and your financial support. Thank you and God bless.
Thank you, uh, Steve. He works hard all through the year balancing uh, the books. We're really grateful for, for what he does. Uh, just a practical note on the book, uh, bookstore. Um, so we close slightly earlier tomorrow and, and pack down. And so just be aware, today really is the day. And you can help us with pack down. But ideally, if you can help us today rather than tomorrow, I think you get what I mean. Uh, we'd love to see you there. One of the privileges of this work is, is not just to be recommending good books. We want to be doing that but is to, to seek to serve you as you come and ask questions of recommendations or advice, but also bringing practical pastoral issues that you bring that you want books to speak into. And I, what has struck me over the last three weeks is the number of times where the, it's really down to the authority of Scripture that the issue relates do we sit under God's word or do we sit alongside it or do we go our own way? And that seems to come up so often, whether it's a, a battle that a friend's going through or, or something that we're struggling with. And it's something that the Keswick Convention want to have front and center uh, each time we meet, that we sit under the authority of God's word. God's word is, is front and center and it's what we follow and so I want to recommend books today that are really going to help us be excited that that is a good place to be, that while it's countercultural, it is the place where Christians sit under the authority of God's Word. It's why Keswick Ministries uh, produced this book by Steve, uh, sorry, by um, Tim Chester, sorry, called Bible Matters, helping us to be excited that we sit under uh, God's Word and then how is it that we can follow that? How is it that we can, in our day-to-day -day life, practically say God's word comes first? I've found this a very helpful book and recommended it numerous, of ta numerous times. There are also times where, perhaps as, as we're starting out as a Christian or we, we're discipling somebody who's just new to the faith and we want to introduce them to, to the, the authority of Scripture, when there are so many voices buying for our attention and seeking to crowd out God's word. Andy Prime's little book, Voices, Who Are You Listening To?, is a great little primer to get started uh, of, uh, as, as the noise of the world can so easily distract. How is it that we can come to God's word, listen carefully in the power of his Holy Spirit to hear what God has to say? And uh, it, the, the way that this book is set out is very accessible, very practical. Uh, there's, there's good application, there's case studies, there's questions, there's verses to kind of hold on to and memorize. Very good place to, uh, to, to start if, uh, if you're discipling somebody in, in, in that position. And then finally, we've got an exit book this, uh, this morning uh, by Andrew Wilson called Unbreakable. Now, th this last week was our, our biggest seller by quite a long way. What Andrew is, is seeking to do is, look, there are people who will say, oh, I'll have Jesus. Yeah, I'll, I'll have forgiveness. I definitely want some of that. But when it comes to the tricky bits of the Bible, the bits that are a bit sort of countercultural or really go against the flow, I think I want to leave those to, to one side. And what he's doing here in this little book, Unbreakable, is saying, look, you cannot separate the Son of God and the Word of God. They come together and they are unbreakable. Even those tricky bits, those hard bits to understand, those bits that, to be honest, we wish weren't there. But God has said, no, this is the way that I want you to go. Unbreakable, just a quid. Why not consider the people in your church family that you might be able to go home and bless by putting this into their hands? Let's be people who sit under God's word and we're unashamed to do that. Come what may, even when it's hard. Three books that will help us stick to God's word. Thanks. Thanks, Jonathan, very much. We're about to come to hear God's word read and then preached by Martin. I'd like to welcome as our reader, Nick. Nick Murray here. Do come up here. So Nick's come to one of the teaching and training events we run through the years. It's the Bible workshop, 24-hour workshop. We were looking at the books of Job and Ecclesiastes with Jamie Grant. So Nick, tell us about yourself. What do you do? Uh, so I'm a curate in the Church of England. I live in Harrogate and work in two churches just outside of Harrogate in Panel and Beckwithshaw. Okay, so Curate in the Church of England, and you came to the Bible workshop on Job and Ecclesiastes. Yeah. Tell us, why did you come, how did it help you? So, I, I think, I, I mean, I, signed, I think I was one of the first people to sign up for this uh, just after the last Keswick Convention. And I didn't, you know, there's no way that I could have envisaged what was going to happen in my life. Next. And I came to, you know how sometimes... 24 hours, surely God can't do too much in 24 hours, can he? But the, 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 the thing is, 
as, we, as I came, I had no idea how, how my life was going to be over the period from Keswick to then. And I, then to hear God speaking to Job, that moment where he speaks in the storm and through the storm, and maybe is the storm, and saying, I think I can trust this God again um, with all that's going on. Mm, that was... Wow. Yeah, it's really good. <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah. Thank you. Bless yeah. you, Nick. Thank you, yeah. It'd be lovely to pray for Nick as he reads and for Martin as he preaches. Remembering God's word is powerful to speak into our lives wherever we are. Loving God and Father, thank you for the way you blessed Nick through that course. Thank you for him as he reads your word and for Martin as he preaches. Lord, we would see Jesus. By your Holy Spirit, meet with us, we pray, and bring change in Jesus' name. Amen. And I think the Bible workshops have Ros Clark speaking to us on Song of Solomons this year. That's going to be a treat. Do come. Bring your wife. Uh, it's going to be a good one. The Bible reading this morning comes to us from Genesis chapter 32. And we're reading from verse 22 to 31. Genesis 32, verses 22 to 31. That night, God got up. Uh, sorry, that night, Jacob got up and took his two wives his two female servants, his two male servants, and his eleven sons, and crossed the ford at Jabok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw he could not overcome him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, so that his hip was wrenched. Was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask me my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, thanks very much indeed, Nick, and uh, good morning again, everybody. Lovely to see you, as always. If you can have a Bible open in front of you, uh, that's going to help you and me. Uh, we're doing something a little bit more ambitious this morning than what was read. We're, I'm actually hoping I'm going to walk you all the way through chapters 32 and 33 uh, in their entirety, um, because they really belong together. So if you can see that in, in a Bible, um, that is going to be helpful to us. And uh, as we begin, I want to remind you of um, that famous speech, uh, June the 4th, 1940, and Winston Churchill stood up in the House of Commons and gave that very famous address. And at the end of it, it had those, those kind of immortal lines, didn't it, where he said, uh, we shall not flag or fail, we shall go on to the end. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. And um, while that, that speech sort of it, it, it captured the hearts and minds and, and sort of the feelings of, of, of Britain in wartime, if I may be a little bit controversial, I want to suggest it's perhaps the absolute antithesis to the call of the gospel. Remember the Bible describes us as by nature enemies of God. And the way we get his blessing is, is not by kind of trying to climb up. And it's, it's not by fighting against God until we win. Actually, no, the gospel message is we must surrender. 
That's really what we're going to see as we look at this, this weird encounter, uh, Jacob's wrestling with God. What we're going to learn is that actually surrender and submission is the path to the blessing. We mustn't say when we come towards God, we'll never surrender. We must say we, we must surrender. And in some ways, as we come to this uh, from chapter 28 yesterday to 32 today, uh, something of, of a turn has happened, is happening in Jacob's life. And, and what we've got here in chapters 32 and 33 is a, a sort of a little pen portrait of a life that is being changed by God. What has happened since we, uh, since we left off yesterday? Well, Jacob has arrived uh, and stayed with Uncle Laban. And, uh, and actually, the period in between chapters 28 and 32 is somewhere around about 20 years. And those haven't been easy. There's been points where it seems Jacob has had meetings with God. God has spoken to him. And his life is turning, but it hasn't been easy. In chapter 31, verse 3, the Lord had said to, to Jacob, Go back to the land of your fathers, to your relatives. And I will be with you. The same command comes as, uh, as, as God appears a bit later in that same chapter, verse 13. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar, where you made a vow to me. Now leave this land at once and go back to your native land. And really that is, that is what he's, he's doing. He's taking his family he is leaving Laban, he's, he's leaving the old life, he's leaving sort of the darkness, and he's going back. He's going back to the land, as God has commanded him to do. And as he does this, we're going to see uh, kind of five headings, five uh, parts to these chapters. And, uh, and as we begin, the first thing we see is this, uh, Jacob seeks Reconciliation. That's our, our first heading this morning, is that Jacob seeks reconciliation with um, Esau. So in chapter 32, beginning at verse 1, we see this, Jacob also went on his way, and the angels of God met him, and, and when Jacob saw them, he said, this is the camp of God, so he named that place uh, Machanaim. Jacob sent messengers ahead of him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. He instructed them, this is what you are to say to my Lord Esau. Your servant Jacob says, I've been staying with Laban and have remained there till now. I have cattle and donkeys, sheep and goats, male and female servants. Now I'm sending this message to my Lord that I may find favor in your eyes. You see what Jacob is doing? As he, as he kind of sets out, as, as this turn is happening in his life and he's, he's setting out back to the homeland, there's something he needs to do. There's, there's a pit stop that he just has to make before he can travel on, before he can dwell in peace and safety. Some of you know, don't you, if, you're, if you're parents of young children, you know about the idea of kind of the vital pit stop. Maybe as you're making your way back down at the M6 on Saturday, and you know, if you've got little ones, don't you, that there'll come a point in that journey where they'll say, I need the loo. And you know at that moment you've got, you've got probably minutes, minutes to hope that you pass a service station and you, and you pull in and you get out of time and you, you do the necessary and you, you make that vital pit stop. This is Jacob's vital pit stop. He wants to return home. He wants to obey God's voice, but he knows there's this problem with Esau still, doesn't he? Remember how we left things at the end of chapter 27? Esau was breathing out murderous threats. He was saying, I'm waiting until the day when my dad dies, and then I'm going to kill Jacob. And so Jacob knows if he's ever to really find peace, if he's ever to really come home, he's got to make things right. He's got to seek this, this reconciliation of this fractured relationship. In some ways, that's, um, that's a key part of, of the Christian life, isn't it? It's recognizing that actually when we, when we become Christians, it's not just that we get a relationship mended in sort of the vertical, 
But it means our relationships are affected too in the, the horizontal, doesn't it? What's the greatest commandment? Somebody once asked Jesus, you know, what's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, our worship of God is not just about us and him, but it's about our relationships with one another. Jesus said this, didn't he, in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, verse 23. Jesus says that if you are offering your gift at the altar and remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled. Then come and offer your gift. The Lord's Prayer itself, doesn't it? It tells us, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Or Romans 12, verse 18, says this, If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. It's a really helpful verse there, isn't it? (laughs) If it's possible, it's not always possible. And as far as it depends on you, live at peace. Paul's a realist. He knows it's, it's not always possible. Peace and restored relationships are not always entirely in our hands, are they? It it sort of requires both parties. But he says, as far as it's possible, and as far as it depends on you, live in peace. This is one of the implications of the gospel, that we love God and we love our neighbor. So let me kind of ask you straight and honestly this morning, are there any unreconciled relationships in your life? Are there people who who come to mind, even as I'm talking, you think, yeah, I I know the relationship with them isn't isn't great. Maybe maybe you deliberately avoid them as you have coffee after the church service. Maybe you don't really respond to their emails or their WhatsApp messages. Maybe, Maybe you've kind of cut them out. And the Bible says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, Live at peace. Is, is, there, is there a relationship you need, you need to mend as far as it depends on you that, that you need to reach out and fix something that is broken? That, that's not an easy thing. I imagine it was very difficult for Jacob to kind of get his head around having to do this, but he knew that if he was ever to truly find peace and to dwell in God's peace, then he, he couldn't have this unreconciled situation. He had to step into it. That's the first thing. Jacob seeks reconciliation. Second heading that we're going to see is uh, is Jacob has to cry out to God in the midst of this. Uh, Look down with me at verse 6 of chapter 32. Uh, When the messengers returned to Jacob, they said, We went to your brother Esau. Good news. He's coming to meet you. Bad news. 400 men are with him. (laughs) How how do you feel at that point? Uh, Verse 7 tells us, in great fear and distress, uh, Jacob Jacob hears this news. Is this this a welcome party or is this a war party? As he's reached out to his brother, is his brother like, right, now I know where you are. Got your postcard. Me and 400 men, we're coming. And I'm going to do what I vowed to do at the end of chapter 27. And in this, what does Jacob do? Or was, how, how can he respond? Well, he divides up the people with him into two groups in the hope that if, verse 8, Esau comes and attacks one, the other group may escape. And then verse 9, he does something interesting. Notice verse 9, he does something for the very first time. Or at least it's the first time we're told he does this. For the first time in his life, Faced with an obstacle, he prays. He prays, and look how he prays. It's, it's quite, quite remarkable, actually. He says, God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord, you said to me, go back to your country and your relatives, and I will make you prosper. Verse 10, look at this. I'm unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you've shown your servants. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I've become two camps. 
Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau. For I'm afraid. He'll come and attack me. And also the mothers with their children. But you've said, I'll surely make you prosper. I will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. It's a remarkable prayer, isn't it? He, <laughs> Jacob, with, with everything that's gone before, he's, gonna, he's reached this point where, where his, his prayer is so it's an appeal to the character of God and the promise of God. He says, you're the God of my father, the God of Abraham, the, the God of Isaac. You're the God who promised that he'd make us uh, as numerous as the sand of the seashore. You're the God that promised you'd be with us. I, I'm appealing to you, God. I'm appealing on the basis of who you are, and I'm appealing on the basis of, of kind of me. I, I'm unworthy. I'm unworthy. See what he says? Look, what do I have when I left? I had nothing. I only had my staff. All I had was a stick, and sticks are free. I, I had nothing. I'm completely unworthy and, and you have blessed me, you've, cut, you, you've, you've poured out abundantly on me and, and you've given me all these things. And on that basis, please save me. It's a great example to us, isn't it, of, of how to pray. I, I don't know what your prayer life is like. Mine is a bit like this. Uh, my youngest daughter, uh, Kezia, uh, when she was uh, a toddler, she was out playing in the garden one day, and she, she was playing with the toys, and she, she picked up one of them, and, uh, and as she picked it up, on it was this kind of this big spider, and then she saw it, she saw it, she saw, it, saw the spider, and she, she turned around, and, and she came running to, towards me, she kept toddling, toddling towards me, going, help, 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 help. <laughs> I thought, my, my prayer life's a bit like that. Is yours? Prayer life can be a, a bit like, I, I, I can so easily forget to pray, and I can rush into the busyness of the day, and, uh, and when, when I'm really up against something, then I was, help, 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 help. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong, is there, with the, the throwing up the arrow prayer right where you are. There's nothing wrong with that. But is that the only way that we pray? Or do we learn to pray a bit more like this? Do we learn to bring our, our kind of gratitude to God? Do we, do we say, God, you've blessed me so much. You've been so kind. You've poured out so much on me. Because, you know, when, it, when we do remember to pray like that, it kind of shapes all the other prayers, doesn't it? When I begin my prayers with, God, thank you. Thank you that I've got a roof over my head. Thank you that I've got food in my cupboards. Thank you that I can just turn on that tap and there's clean running water that isn't going to kill me. When I thank God, I'm, I'm unworthy of all of that and you've given me all of that. It just kind of relativizes all the other things I'm worried about. It changes the way I pray. It changes what I pray for. Prayer is essentially the expression of dependence, isn't it? On God. How do you pray? When do you pray? Do you, do, you need to, do you need to restart those, those morning prayers? You know, the ones that have just slipped and, and you get so discouraged, don't you? You feel so bad about it that you, it feels hard to get back on the horse. But just, just start again. Start tomorrow. You think, but I'm not very good at it and I don't pray for very long. It doesn't matter. There's, there's no right or wrong time on it. If, if for you tomorrow's right, I'm going to sit down with a cup of coffee. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to pray for two minutes. Start there. Do it a couple of times next week. Start there. It's a great place to start, isn't it? What about your church? Do you have, we've already had prayer meetings mentioned this week, do you have prayer meetings? Do you have small groups that meet midweek? You might call them home groups or cell groups or whatever you call them. Do you have those? And are they a priority in your, in your schedule? Or are they a bit, one of those things you say, look, they're a bit for the keeny beanies, aren't they? And, and if, if I can find time in the business of the week, and if I get all the emails answered, and if there's nothing else to do, and, and I don't have to go and do the Sainsbury's big shop, then I'll go. Or is it, is it a priority? If you lead those groups, are you teaching people to pray? You know what home groups are like, don't you? As you go around the circle, what can we pray for? Can we just pray for my neighbor's cat? A terrible eye infection. It'd be great to pray for that. Are we, are we, are we teaching people to pray like this? Say, God, I'm so unworthy of your kindness and, and your character and your promises are so good. Are we helping people learn to pray, to express their dependence, to start with gratitude? 
But Jacob is, um, he's being changed. He's not completely there yet. He does pray, but he also has something else up his sleeve. Verse 13, we read, he, he selected a gift for his brother Esau. 200 female goats, that's a lot. 20 male goats, 200 ewes, 20 rams, 30 female camels and they're young. I don't even know how you, where, you, where you get that many camels or where you keep them, but he's got them. 40 cows, 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys, 10 male donkeys. And then he sends them. He sends them ahead and he instructs the one in the leads, when you meet my brother Esau and he asks, who do you belong to? Where are you going? Then you give them the gift. Here's the gift sent. And he instructed the second and the third, verse 19, all the others, you ought to say the same thing when you meet Esau. And be sure to say your servant Jacob is coming behind us. And notice the narrator's comment, verse 20, for he thought, I'll pacify him with these gifts I'm sending on ahead. The word pacify there is it's the little Hebrew word, uh, kippur. And uh, you, may, you may be familiar with that word, kippur, because it's associated with one of the, the big Jewish festivals uh, called Yom Kippur, which means the day of atonement. Very good. What is, what is Jacob trying to do? It's a sense which he's trying to, he's trying to atone for his sin. He's, uh, he, he's a man being changed. But he's not a perfect man, is he? He's still, he's still living that life of saying, I can, I'm, I'm praying, but, but, but I'll also try and do a bit myself. I'll take some things into my own hands. I'll, I'll try and make this right and, and I'll try and atone. And, and actually, as we'll see, it, it, it's not really going to work anyway. And then, then the narrator leaves off. And it's a bit frustrating, isn't it? It's a bit like one of those EastEnders kind of cliffhangers. We've had the build-up. He's sent the message. We know Esau's coming with 400 men. We know Jacob has sent the messengers ahead. And we're sort of like, what's going to happen? And at this point, the narrator breaks off and won't come back to it until the start of chapter 33. And we have this, this bizarre midnight encounter, perhaps the other most famous part of Jacob's story. It takes us to our third heading, where at Jacob clings to God. Verse 22, at that night, Jacob got up. He took his two wives, his two female servants and his 11 sons and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. And after he sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. Verse 24, so Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him till daybreak. It's another, like in 28, it's another one of those nighttime encounters. And it's bizarre, isn't it? What is happening here? This, kind of, this, this man appears from nowhere and, and jumps him. And they seem to spend all night until daybreak wrestling. I don't know if you remember, uh, if you're of a certain age, those, the Saturday afternoon British wrestling. Do you remember it? Big Daddy, giant haystacks. There'd be all these storylines, these, these mega battles, and, and the good guys will always win, and the bad guys always have to run away. Or maybe if you're younger, it's kind of WWE, if any, if any of you are fans of that. Back in the day, it was Hulk Hogan, but The Rock, Triple H, Roman Reigns, John Cena. All, all these, names familiar to you? I don't know. That's how I'm kind of picturing this scene. Here's Jacob and the man, and I don't know, maybe there's flying elbows and suplexes off the top rope, I don't know, but, but there's this wrestling match that's happening, this, this encounter that's happening. And there's three puzzles here, aren't there? There's probably more. Three puzzles. First puzzle, who exactly is he wrestling? Who, who is it? We're told it's, it's a man. Later, Jacob will name the place Peniel, saying it's because I saw God face to face. Jacob thinks he's met God. In Hosea 12, Hosea will tell us it's the angel of God. Well, which one is it? The church fathers thought it was Jesus, a pre-incarnate Jesus. The answer's not actually that obvious, so I'm sorry to tell you. Often in the Old Testament... The angel of God and God himself 
seem to be sort of overlapping. Actually, we saw that just back in uh, chapter 31. Verse 11, uh, the angel of God appears and then says, I am the God of Bethel. Same thing happens to Moses in the burning bush. The angel of God appears and says, I am the Lord. Seems to be this overlap. Paul identifies the the angel of God that that leads the people in Exodus 23. In 1 Corinthians 10, Paul identifies that as Christ. So you've got this thing, is it it God? Is it the angel of God? Is it the pre-incarnate Christ? Don't know. Don't know. We're not told. But, But there's clearly an encounter with the divine. That much is clear, uh, because Jacob calls this place Peniel. Whoever it is, however we're supposed to identify, it probably doesn't really matter, but I saw God face to face. That's who it is. The second puzzle, verse 25. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, they think, really? How, how can God not overpower him? How can this angel of, the, angel of the Lord, God, pre-incarnate Christ, how can he not beat him? He's God, he's, he's, he's omnipotent, he's all-powerful. How can he not beat him? I think what, we, we're trying to be, I think what the narrator is trying to get at here is, is when we say, look, the man saw he couldn't overpower him. I think there's a sense in which, humanly speaking, no sort of, no mere man, is going to be able to change Jacob. No force of, of human strength or power will change him. It will take divine intervention. It will take God himself to really overcome and defeat Jacob. And actually, you see, he can overpower him, really. Because in verse 25... After they've wrestled, he, it just simply with the touch, just, just the touch of the socket. And Jacob's hip is wrenched as he wrestled. And the man said, let me go for it's daybreak. But Jacob replied, I'll not let you go unless you bless me. What you realize, don't you, is you, as they wrestle, it looks like you can't overpower him. It gets to a point where, where just with the merest touch, it's over. Just with the slightest effort, Jacob is thoroughly undone. And he's defeated, and you realize that the man has been holding back. He's been holding back. It's, it's a bit like when, um, when dads wrestle with their kids, isn't it? That, if you're a dad with little kids and you have, you have a little bit of rough and tumble on the living room floor, you don't, you don't put all of your strength in it, do you? You don't pick up your two year old and start kind of slapping them around. You know, suplex, pile driver, power bomb. You don't just smash them up and say, right, that'll learn you. Don't come back for more. No, Dad, you, you hold it back, don't you? Because that's, that's part of it. That's, but you're, you're holding back most of your strength so that the, the, the game can kind of continue. As you get older, this changes. My eldest, Noah, is 16. I, I can't hold back anymore. He's, he's, he's bigger than me. <laughs> he's stronger than me. I can still take him. Because I fight dirty. I just, just get him just there. Just, just pinch that inside with a thigh. That's it. He's done. So there's, no, there's, there's no holding back. You can, I, I can't do that. But the, the man, the wrestler, has been holding back. And, and when he wants to, he just, he completely overcomes him. He completely submits him. And, and Jacob is, is hanging on. And Jacob, and notice, it's important we see what's happening here. Jacob replies, look, I'll... I'll not let you go unless you bless me. The man asks, what's your name? Jacob, he answers. He says, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. And as, as Jacob is clinging on, he's, he's not clinging on because he thinks he can still win. He, he's, not, he's not holding on because he thinks, look, if I, if I can just kind of get, get a good position, I can reverse this, and I'll get him in an arm lock, and I'll submit him, and, and then I'll win. No, he's, he's clinging on in submission. He's clinging on in surrender. He's saying, he knows he's defeated, but he's hanging on and saying, just bless me. I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. He's not holding on to win. He's holding on in submission. He's holding on in surrender. I don't know if you've seen that, um, that crazy American sports um, 
bull riding. You seen cowboys do this? You've seen this on the telly. It's described as the riskiest eight seconds in sport. And, and the, the aim of what they do is they, they ride on these bulls and these bulls are kicking them everywhere, trying to throw them off. And, and how do they win? They win by just holding on. They reckon that a Formula One driver in a tight corner experiences about 5G force on their body. A fighter pilot, they reckon in a really tight turn, can, can tolerate up to about 9 or 10G, but only for a very short period. These bull riders, it's reckoned they can experience forces of up to 26G as they're being kind of thrown around like rag dolls. They can be knocked unconscious, not by hitting anything, but just simply by the force in which they are thrown around. And how does the bull rider win? He wins by holding on. He doesn't, he doesn't get down off the bull, does he? He doesn't kind of stand in front of the bull and stare him down and say, right, come on then, son. You and me, let's have it. No, that's, that's, that's crazy. He'd be, he'd be utterly murdered. He just, he just clings on. That's all he can do. He clings on. That is what Jacob is doing in this moment. He's learning that submission is the path to blessing. That surrender is the place from where the blessing will come. And then there's the third puzzle. Did you notice this? Verse 27. The man asks him, what is your name? And again you think, surely he knows. Like This is God. He's wrestling God. Like God knows his name. Why, why is he asking him his name? And here I think is the answer. Sometimes when you read narrative, listen for echoes. And think about this. When was the last time Jacob sought a blessing and was asked for his name? Do you remember? It's back in chapter 27. When he took that bowl of food into his father Isaac to get the blessing, to seek the blessing. And Isaac said, who are you? And he said, Esau. And I think what's happening in this moment is it's almost as if God has got him and God is saying, tell me your name again. Who are you? You want a blessing? Tell me who you are. And this time, no games, no tricks, no lies, no mucking about. You tell me who you are. And what does his name mean? He's deceiver. It's almost like face to face with God. There's no more hiding. And God says, who are you? And if he wants the blessing, he's got to say, I'm Jacob. I'm the deceiver. It's almost as if God has got to bring him face to face with his sin. And he's got to own every part of it before God. And what happens when he does? Isn't this beautiful? This is my favorite part in the whole of Jacob's story. Isn't it beautiful? When he comes to that place of confession of who he really is before God, he gets a brand new name. He gets a brand new identity. You're no longer going to be called Jacob. Now you're called Israel. That happens for each and every Christian, doesn't it? When we, when we come to God and, and we are real with him about who we really are, as we seek his blessing, we confess our sin. He says, right, now I'll give you a new name. A name that will be written on you. You'll now be called Christian. And that will be your identity from here on in. Surrender is the path to blessing. You can't seek the blessing of God unless you're willing to submit and surrender yourself fully to him. Jacob calls the place Peniel saying, because I saw God face to face and yet my life was spared. And then the sun rose. Do you remember we saw yesterday the sun was setting on his life? And now, now the sun rises. Now he's come to the place of surrender. He can move from darkness to light. And he's limping. I think every person whose life has been changed by God walks with a limp. And I think every Christian walks with a limp. I don't mean literally, I mean kind of figuratively. 
Every Christian has had to come to that place then where they, they come to the end of themselves. They recognize who they really are. They, they recognize the lack of health within them, their, their sickness, their illness, their sin. And it's only from that place that God changes us. And as we go on, we know that the rest of our journey home is, is with that limp of being changed by God, of knowing it's, it's not I, but it's Christ in me. It's his power made perfect in our weakness. Here's our fourth, fourth heading. We get back to, back to the story, as it were, in chapter 33. Jacob is trying to begin to make things right. Verse 1, Jacob looked up and, and there's Esau coming with the 400 men. He divides, he divides the children. He, he divides the camps. And then he goes on ahead and he bows down to the ground seven times as he approached his brother. But notice this, isn't this lovely verse 4? But Esau ran to meet Jacob and he embraced him and he threw his arms around his neck and he kissed him and they wept. And I bet they did. It's this beautiful moment. Uh, time has healed. Esau perhaps himself has changed to some degree. And have this beautiful moment of, of reconciliation. He, he finds favor. And he, he brings all these gifts, doesn't he? And it's, it's kind of interesting what he's doing here, I think. He brings the gifts and Esau says, what's the gifts? I've got loads. I don't need the gifts. And he says, no, I, want to, I need to give the gifts. Verse 10, if I found favor in your eyes, accept this gift, for to see your face is like seeing the face of God, because God has answered the prayer. Accept the present that was brought to you, for God has been gracious to me, and I have all I need. What is, um, what is Jacob trying to do here? Well, in a sense, I think it's sort of an act of public repentance. Maybe similar to what Zacchaeus does. You know, Zacchaeus meets Jesus, and Jesus turns his life around. He says, I'm, I will repay. Anyone I've robbed, I'll repay it four times over. It's not an attempt to kind of earn your salvation or, or pay it off in any way, but it's, there's a public repentance. And it's, it's linked, I think, to the blessing of chapter 27. You remember, what, is, what does Jacob do here? He bows and he gives of his abundance. And what, what was the blessing that he tricked, him, he tricked himself a tricked out of Isaac, chapter 27, verse 28. May God give you heaven's dew and earth's richness and abundance of grain and new wine. May nations serve you and peoples bow down to you. See, he's doing, he's almost trying to, it's not, he, he can't reverse the blessing. He can't undo what's been done. He can't, he can't kind of give it back. But as he bows, and as he gives, there's almost a very public acknowledgement there that he had done wrong and that he had obtained what he had through sinful means. And the gift is almost his acknowledgement before he saw of what he'd done, uh, a public repentance in his ongoing sort of pursuit of healed relationship. And then our final heading this morning. Uh, Jacob keeps on going. Uh, there's, uh, there's, there's a kind of an interesting moment where, where Esau says, okay, well, we, we, we've met up again. We're friends. Let us, let us be on our way. I'll accompany you. And Jacob sort of finds a way of saying, thanks, but no thanks. He says, my Lord, my Lord knows the children are, are tender. If they're driven hard, the animals will die, verse 14. So no, let my Lord go on ahead of his servant while I move along slowly at the pace of the flocks and herds. Verse 15, Esau said, well, okay, well, I'll leave some men with you. Jacob says, no, 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 no need. Just let me find favor. So verse 16, Esau started on his way back to Seir. Jacob, however, he's still telling porkies. <laughs> went to Sukkoth. He goes in a different direction. He's, he's heading back towards the promised land. He's, he's heading back to the place God has called him. He goes to Sukkoth. He stops there. And then verse 18, he carries on 
He came from Padan Aram. He arrived safely at the city of Shechem in Canaan and camped within the site of the city. And for a hundred pieces of silver, he brought from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, the plot of ground where he pitched his tent. And there he set up an altar and called it El Eloe Israel. Shechem is uh, it's one of the first places Abraham arrives at. When Abraham is called to follow God and, it, and he leaves his family he comes to this, uh, this, this place, Shechem, and it's, there's a sense in which Jacob is kind of retracing the steps. He's, he, he's going back to where he should be going. There's, a, there's a, a determination now within him to try and follow God's call, to, to, to keep going to the place where God has asked him to go. Some of you may have heard of the, um, the film Gone with the Wind, one of the most famous films, I guess, in the last hundred years. And uh, you you may not know, it started life as a book. And when it was written, its author sent it to all sorts of publishers. And and every time he sent it, it'd get rejected. Sent it out, get rejected. Sent it, get rejected. Sent it, get rejected. After 38 rejections, the book is finally accepted for publication. Today, it sold something like 30 million copies and won a, a Pulitzer Prize. I imagine for the author to keep going, it required an a huge amount of determination. Jacob is learning that, that Christian lesson, isn't he? That, as, as Eugene Peterson has described it, that, that long obedience in the same direction. That's the Christian life, isn't it? It's a long obedience in the same direction. It's, it's not always mountaintops. Thankfully, it's not always the valley floor. It's often pretty mundane and pretty ordinary. But that, that pilgrimage toward heaven requires that that determination to keep traveling in the right direction, that that long obedience, often unheroic, often unspectacular, but quietly walking in the footsteps of the master as we follow his call on our lives. But it's not quite perfect. The geographical detail is significant. We're told that he gets to Shechem, and effectively he settles there. God had told him to go back, and the expectation was he was to go back to Bethel. That's what chapter 31 had told him. But he stops 20 miles short at Shechem. And and there's, there's no reason given. We don't know why he stops short. But he stops short of full obedience. It will prove almost disastrous. Read chapter 34 when you get home. This awful incident with his daughter Dina. And then his sons take matters of revenge, bloody revenge into their own hands. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a grim episode that really is all kind of brought on himself because he, he stopped short of the full obedience. He was meant to get to Bethel. For whatever reason, he, he stopped short. Where, where are you stopping short? of full obedience. Where are you? You're you're following God. Your direction of travel is generally good, but but where in your life have you stopped short? What's that that room in your house that God doesn't get to come into? Where's where's that kind of keep off the grass sign that just wants to keep God out? For me, I don't know, maybe maybe it's, it's my evangelistic witness. Truth be told, I'm a bit of a coward. Don't upset anyone. I don't want anyone to think ill of me. I'm a total people pleaser, so I chicken out. I stop short of all that God really calls me to. Maybe it's it's a relationship in your life that's actually inappropriate. Maybe Maybe it's a bit flirty. Maybe it's gone further. And full obedience means it's got to stop. Maybe it's some of the things we were talking about earlier. There's a, there's a hurt that you've experienced, maybe from church, maybe a leader in church, maybe someone in church, and, and you, you've withdrawn from church. You've withdrawn from really giving yourself to that local mission because of hurts. And actually, you're not, you're not really living in full obedience. You've, you've stopped short because you've been wounded. And that's understandable, but... God doesn't call us to Shechem. He calls us all the way. 
makes us thankful, doesn't it, for Christ's perfect obedience. His perfect obedience, which is entirely credited to our accounts, that when God looks at, at us, he says, actually, look, your, your record of obedience is not what justifies you. Jesus' record is. And his obedience never stops short. It is completely and utterly perfect. What is Jacob learning? What does it mean to, to follow God? What is this little pen portrait of a life being changed by God? Well, it means that Jacob, like us, needs to learn to depend on God more. It means that Jacob, like us, needs to learn more of what it means to, to live at peace with our neighbours. It means that Jacob, like us, needs to learn to keep persevering, heading in the right direction. Churchill said, we will never surrender the Bible says we must always surrender. The Bible says we need to listen to the words, not of Churchill, but of the hymn writer Judson van der Venter, who wrote that famous chorus, I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Saviour. I surrender all. Are you surrendering all to him today? Are you, are you surrendering everything to him? today. What does it mean to follow God? Well, if we could sum it up in six words, it might be these. Love God. Love neighbor. Keep going. Let me pray for us. Our Father in heaven, we... Um, we read your word and we, we want to be people who surrender to you. We want to surrender all of our will, all of our being, all of our time, talent and treasure to your service. We want to people, be people whose, whose gratitude is expressed in our surrender. Forgive us for those places where we've, we've put up those keep out signs. Father, help us to live by the power of your Spirit that we might recognise that actually surrender and submission is the path to blessing. Help us in these things. We are so aware of our weakness and our fallenness. We are so thankful for Jesus' perfect obedience. Help us to live grateful lives of surrender and to live in the enjoyment of all your blessings, that your name will be glorified in our lives. Amen. Thanks, Martin. Thanks, Martin. We're so grateful to what you brought us this morning um, from Genesis. Um, surrender's a really big topic, isn't it? And that central message this morning, surrender is a path to blessing. I guess we've been asked a few questions this morning. So where in your life, where in my life, where are we stopping short of full obedience to God? Maybe it is a relationship. Maybe it's not giving ourselves fully to church. And just remember, always surrendering to God. So I'm going to use this response song to be able to um, say, God, I, I want to surrender to you. And you might want to use this time to pray. You might want to use this time to pray with the person next to you. Um, if something really um, kind of struck you this morning and if you think, hey, I, I need to do something about this. There's also people that would love to pray with you after the meeting um, as well. Maybe people down in the prayer area, any of us you've seen at the front. So, um, yeah, don't go from this place without having um, prayed um, uh, to God about it. So let, let's stand together and let's sing um, in response.
do have a seat. That's the end of our meeting this morning, our Bible reading. It's lovely to finish in that heartfelt prayer. Um, just a couple, a couple of things to say. If you would value someone to pray with after this, again, as before, my left, your right, a prayer area. People would love to pray with you, something the Lord's been saying, particularly uh, to you, that you'd love to talk through and pray with, through with someone. And the other thing to say is that... Um, we're giving away, or there are the publishers of uh, Evangelicals Now are giving away um, free copies of the newspaper Evangelicals Now. It's a kind of Keswick edition in the sense that there's an interview with Jonathan Lamb on the back, and I've done an interview about what Keswick Ministries is about. So do grab one of those as you head out. But otherwise, uh, let's pause and a final prayer as we finish. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.
sing about Father of Mercies. Father of Mercies, the God of all comfort, He draws alongside us in times of distress. If ever we feel that our God has abandoned, we look to the cross where for us Jesus bled. All our hope is found in you. You delivered us from death to life. All our hope is found in you. Father of mercy, to God of my life. Father of mercy, the wellspring of kindness. He comforts his people and lifts up their heads. Renewed by the depths of our Father's compassion, we offer his love and the hope we possess. All our hope. all our sorrows and shares our laments wherever he leads us his comfort will follow we trust in the savior who raises the dead we trust in the savior who raises the dead